coming to the end. We're not at the end yet, but we are in chapter 6, which is the last chapter. And the area that we're going to talk about, and I'll pray in a minute and we'll start the study, but is a, a challenging area. It, it does encourage us to, uh, to think of others, to kind of get our mind off ourself and, and really see how the Lord would use us in the lives of other people. And sometimes that can be challenging because many of us are just, we're, we're just so consumed and busy with life or a lot of us have a mound of our own issues and problems. But yet the Lord would still in those times uh, stretch us. Or some of us, are, we're just tired. You know, we kind of live on tired and God's like, well, let me be your strength. And so we got to, push past a lot of these things. So it's a good, challenging word, and I think very needful for our own personal growth, but the growth of, of God's kingdom, and for God's people, and for his glory. So we're, we're basically only going to cover five verses, but we're going to jump in other areas to uh, really draw from. So why don't we pray, and let God bless this time as we look in the word today. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for this day and for the opportunity you give us to look in your word. We pray that your Holy Spirit would teach us, instruct us, and that you would take your word and that you would apply it deep into our hearts. And then you would carry it out through our lives for your glory. But we thank you for allowing us to come together in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, um, to start, well first, uh, everything looked good on the board and everything? Good. Why don't we uh, give you a little background of Galatians, just a brief one, because the Galatian people, they, uh, they were brought into a proper understanding by Paul the Apostle of the grace of God. And as they were brought into this understanding, they rejoiced. Man, this was great. God loves me. God has a plan for me. In spite of who I am, he died for me, took away all the, the sin, and gave me his eternal life. And they were very excited in that. But these people came in, they call them Judaizers, because they tried to convince the Galatians, well, God did open that door, but you got to do a lot of good things and works and all these keeping of the law to, to really get through that door. And then they put a heavy trip on them. And what happened was, is the Galatians end up then, in turn, putting a heavy trip on others. And they became very legalistic. you got to do this, this, and this, and this, or you know, you're not even saved or even you know, accepted by God. And putting all these Old Testament laws into their New Testament life, and because of that, in this place of having this, you know, feeling superior in the spirit to others, they became judgmental and legalistic and really looked down at others that were, were not following the way they would. And this is also in the backdrop where we're going to be in chapter 6 against what we read last week about the fruit of the spirit or more importantly, about the battle between the spirit and the flesh. That there is this battle between our old nature and the new nature God has given us. The old nature of the flesh and the new nature of the spirit, the Holy Spirit, inside us. So there's this battle that takes place. And here in that backdrop, he moves and expresses this heart about bearing one another's burdens. Caring for those that, man, they, they, they've just, uh, they're having a rough time. And even pushing that beyond in that caring of others, but helping others lift back up, get back up, even if their fall was of their own doing. Even if they messed up. 
He's encouraging the believers, hey, you go help them up. Yeah, but that was their own fault. doesn't matter. You go lift them up and help them through this tough time, even if it's a tough time they created. So he's encouraging them in this. And so why don't we jump right in to, uh, to chapter 6, and I'm actually going to read the five verses we're going to cover so we kind of get it in full before we dissect it a little bit. And it begins this way in chapter 6 of Galatians, verse 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou shall be tempted. Bear you one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another." For every man shall bear his own burden. And we'll unpack that as we move through. But in the initial beginning of this, as I stated earlier, we know that the Galatians had become self-righteous and very legalistic. They probably felt that they would be defiled if they reached out or stoop down to help someone who was even trapped under their own messy situation. They felt, oh, I, 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 you know, they deserve that, or I don't want to be defiled. I don't want to get in, even involved in their mess. And there is this kind of self-righteous attitude about them that had crept in. And so here, the Holy Spirit through Paul the Apostle is addressing it to this church. It was obvious from the text that they weren't doing this. That's why they needed to be instructed on this. That they need to be instructed that, man, you got to bear each other's burdens. you got to help your fallen brother or sister. you got to help those that have messed up their life and, and restore them and help them get on the right track that this is what you're called to do, and they thought, well, I don't have to do any of that. I'm kind of holy and pious, and it's their own fault, and they should be doing the things that I do. And he's like, man, get off your high horse and get down there and help the people. you got to give of your, well, I can't be bothered. i got too many other things to do. Well, probably none of them is more important than seeing a lost soul get saved or seeing a fallen brother or sister restored. That probably kind of takes priority. But they, they weren't seeing it that way. And they had to be instructed. Our example of the Lord, man, he had no problem allowing his life to touch sinful man, sinful women. He had no problem having that heart to restore someone that, that had a, a fallen situation in their life take place, even of their own doing, to bring them back to the Father's arms. When the Pharisees and the religious leaders wanted a woman who was caught in adultery to be stoned, he was the one that says, woman, your sins are forgiven. Now go walk in that right way. Go sin no more. You have the ability now through the grace of God to get your life on the right path and move forward. So he had no problem touching the lives of others. No matter if they fell by by circumstances outside of their control or even of their own doing. He would reach out to those people. And we need to pray and ask God, Lord, 
May my life be like yours. To sit down with publicans and sinners. To restore the lost and the hurting. To even love the unlovable. May I allow your Holy Spirit to change my heart and to move my life with a, with a compassion for others. You see, that needs to be the prayer of a believer in Christ. That the Lord would move us in this place where we kind of come outside of our own shell and we move into this place where we're able to see the needs of others and then not just see them, but to attend to them, to, to minister to them, to allow the needs of others to kind of wake up our heart and, and move us with compassion for the lost. In fact, you see many places in Scripture where Jesus was moved with compassion. The text even declares that. In fact, I want to look at some of these places together. So turn to Matthew chapter 9. Gospel of Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, I just want to read here a verse. I'll read verse couple, starting with verse 35. It says, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitude, notice what it doesn't say. He was like, oh no, not another crowd of people. Not another group that needs me. I mean, I've just been ministering all day, and then there is another group of people no, it doesn't say that. It says when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. And it's like, Lord, I think I need some heart surgery. I think you need to cause my heart, at those times especially, when I'm just, I'm shot, I'm tired, I've, I'm weary, but there is a need, and I close my heart to the need, close my eyes to it, to say, Lord, soften my heart that it will be moved with compassion to do the things that you would have me to do. And so these are the things that we need to be looking and praying and asking God, because I know as time goes on, we all get weary. We get tired. We get beat down. Many of us have extended that love to others only to be hurt, only to be stomped on by the people we're trying to help. And that makes it even harder then to extend yourself and say, I got to push through that. But nevertheless, I know deep within me that that is the right way to live because that's the way my Savior lived. That's the way He lived walked was when he walked on this earth and, and still is, obviously, today with that heart of compassion. Turn to chapter 14 of Matthew. In chapter 14, let's look at this starting in verse 9. Now, Herod the king had a pretty wicked wife that he really shouldn't even have had. He made a vow to the daughter of this wife who danced before the king and all the people that were with the king that if you ask anything, I'll give it to you up to half the kingdom. Well, at the time, John the Baptist was in prison because the king and 
his wife were very mad at him because he called them out. And so the daughter danced, went to the mom and said, what should I ask for? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. I want to get rid of this guy that keeps pointing out that I'm doing wrong. And so the king, in verse 9, was very sorry. Nevertheless, for the oath's sake, and them that sat with him, he commanded it to be given her. And he sent and beheaded John in prison. And his head was brought in a, in a vessel, a charger, and given to the damsel, the, the daughter, and she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came and took the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin. He was also the forebearer of Christ to pronounce, Behold, the Lamb of God. Now Jesus gets this news, and, and in his humanity, obviously, he's very sad. He's got his own hurts. He's got his own problems, his own issues within the family, situations that are just heavy upon his heart. And when he heard this, he departed thence into a ship, into a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. And so here, Jesus is like, man, I just, I need to get alone. I need to, you know, this is just too heavy. I need to get alone. And so he goes out, departs, and he's like, I just need some time. I'm overwhelmed, I'm, I'm pulled at on every side, now I got this bad news, my heart is heavy, I just need to separate from society and just get alone. And there are moments that God gives us those times of reprieve and there's nothing wrong with them, absolutely nothing. But there are times in those moments when we feel like we need a reprieve God says, i got to stretch you a little more. And I'm like, no, Lord. Lord, you don't need to stretch me anymore. I, I think you need to stretch my brother Ray. I think that's who you need to stretch. And the Lord's like, um, no, I think i got the right address, Kirk. I need to stretch you. And at that moment, I've got a decision to make. And so here, when this happened with Jesus, he departed in this place, in verse 14, and Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude, and what was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick, and he continued to minister. And when it was evening, his disciples came, saying, this is a desert place, time is past, send the multitude away. Haven't you had enough? And he, they said, send the multitude away, that they may go into the village and buy themselves fiddles, food. And Jesus said unto them, they need not to part, give them to eat. And then he said to them that were there, bring whatever you have. And they had very little, not enough to feed them, not enough to even make a dent. And there are times that I look at my life and I think I don't have enough to even make a dent. I don't have enough within me. But they gave it to the Lord and he blessed it and he multiplied it. And it's in those times I need to say, Lord, I have nothing left. I am spent. But obviously you brought a need at my door. May you multiply the little there, and if there's nothing, may you infuse me with you so that there is something there that I may give. And the people ate and were blessed, and there were plenty left over. It's really trusting God to take care of us in those moments and being obedient to what he calls us to do. Now, sometimes it's easier. I, you know, for me, it's like I know I just got to push through this. I got to go. I got to do what I, I should do. But I got to be honest, there are times that it's hard. A couple of those times I remember 
was right in the middle of a Buffalo Bills game. And I get a phone call. And I think, why aren't they watching the Bills game? Don't they realize that I'm watching the Bills game? I have nothing left to give. I gave everything Sunday morning, and this is Sunday afternoon, and, and we're, we're going down ready to score. And the Lord's like, that's why I picked this time, Kirk. I picked it to, to allow you to just die to yourself. And I thought, you know... I think I'm going to have a recording next time. That when they call, all of a sudden they hear, hello, this is Kirk. Hey, before you even talk, I think it's important that I just lead you in a prayer for about an hour. <laughs> and I think you'll be better off if I just pray about an hour for you. So just listen, be patient, and have that as my recording, you know? And the Lord just wouldn't allow it. And you got to just say, okay, Lord, push me past this moment. Push me past it. And he does, and he fills you. And when it's all said and done, there's a whole lot left over for you to eat of. A whole lot of his strength left over for you. And so this is kind of what we're learning in Galatians here, is that this is what we're called to do, and we have an example of Jesus Christ, and he was moved with compassion. Just uh, in, in thought, just for reference, you can look up Matthew 29, or 15, verses 29 to like 32, and there Jesus also again was moved with compassion. After he already ministered, he's like, yeah, but they still need more of my compassion to feed them. And so he ministered to them. But turn to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. We're given a, an account here that we've labeled as the Good Samaritan. And it's an account that, that is told to us that Jesus tells us in the understanding of a question about loving others. Love the Lord with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. And it was asked of him, well, who is my neighbor? So he moves into this understanding with this uh, parable, and he says in verse 30, and Jesus answered, Answering said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. He saw him. He, he's a certain priest. Now again, tying it back to the Galatians, the Galatians were, were influenced by these Judaizers, these thinking they were spiritually, you know, uh, above the others, that they were, you know, just, um, they had a, a closer walk with God because of all the stuff they did. And here they thought they were a little superior. And that's when Jesus in that chapter of Galatians 6 says, listen, you got to bear one another's burdens. Don't give me this holier than thou. Don't give me this, you're too busy. Don't give me this, well, hey, I can't get near the sinners lest I be defiled. You reach into even the gutters and try to help someone. And so this religious leader is passing by and he's walking along. He probably thinks, you know, i got important places to go. I got a busy life. I got to keep my schedule here. So he's on a journey and he's passing by and he's like, whoa, -oh. look at that up ahead. There's an accident. And he's thinking, I don't have time to go help at that accident. I've got my own places to be. Ooh, it looks pretty messy too up there. 
I don't think I want to get involved in it. It's a little too messy for me. It's a tragedy, whatever's up ahead. But what's up ahead is the tragedy of a person's life. And he says, well, though I see it up here, I'm going to pretend like I don't see it. And I'm going to go around the situation. There's probably someone else that can help. And he avoids it and goes around. Was that loving his neighbor? No. And so he moves on with this scenario. And he says, and likewise, a Levite, when he was in the place, came and looked upon him and passed by the other side. Now this indication is he got a little closer. He didn't just see this up ahead. He came and he looked down on him and he's like, oh man, I was willing to help, but not after what I just saw. This is too messy for me. This is too much for me. I, I at least came close, but you know, their life is too much of a mess. Instead of trusting God to give you the strength to deal with that mess, to help that brother or sister up off the ground, they decided it's too much. And so what they did is they kind of, it almost has the implication that they stepped over it, you know? Or, you know, stepped around it, you know, and just kind of moved on. That they, they just looked and they're like, this is too much. Kind of like, I don't have enough resources to help this. And maybe that's true. But remember the five loaves and the two fishes? There wasn't enough resources to fill, feed the thousands. But when you bring the little bit you have to Jesus, he has a way of multiplying it. And he gives you the extra strength to tend to the need, no matter how great it is. And not only will that be a blessing to the one who's following, or followed, fall in, sorry, but it will be a blessing to you because it will strengthen you in the faith. And so here, this is what happened, and he passed by. But a certain Samaritan, and the Samaritans weren't liked by the Jews, and, and I think it went the other way too, Prejudice always goes both ways, though it, it doesn't portray itself that way. But the Jews didn't like the Samaritans, and the Samaritans, they're like, well, we don't want anything to do with those Jews then if they don't want anything to do with us. And he looked down, and he saw a Jew laying on the ground, and he saw him being had compassion on him. And it's those moments that I need to be like, Lord, give me the compassion for what I see so that I help and stay with it and trust you so that the person can get through this problem, this situation, even if it's of their own fault. Give me that strength to do it. And he was moved with compassion and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in the oil and wine, and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. He took care of this guy. He continued to minister. And then even on the tomorrow, on the morrow, when he departed, he took out some money and gave it to the innkeeper. And he said unto him, take care of him and whatever you spend more than this, I'll come again and repay you. You know, sometimes being moved with compassion will cost you something. It costs you time. It may cost you resources. But it's still the right thing to do. And we trust God to take care of whatever we need. And that will not be a condition on what we give that we give beyond what we think. And God always, 
always fills us up again. Fills us afresh. And so Jesus was encouraging them on this. And then he says in the next verse, which now of these three thinkest thou was the neighbor unto the man that fell among thieves? And he said, he that showed mercy on him, then Jesus said unto him, go and do likewise. You see, we're, we're commanded, we're called to do this. And I know it's hard. I know. I know it's tiring. I, I know the older you get, it's like, man, I am tired. I'm wiped out. But the Lord will bring up at times, he'll bring up times where you can rest. But other times he'll bring up that you got to push through it and trust him for the strength. And so, well, you can turn back to Galatians. So in seeing that example, we again read, brethren, in verse 1, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness considering thyself, lest thou be tempted. A, a couple thoughts in that. One is that you who are spiritual, it says. I think one of the key things that, that helps all of us is that very understanding is that, Lord, help me to be a spiritual man. Help you to be a spiritual woman. Lord, may I take the time in my life to grow in the faith, to take the time in my devotions, to take the time reading the Word of God, praying to you, worshiping you, and then allowing my life to be stretched at moments to serve you so that when a situation falls in my lap or is in the path of my walk or right out in front of me, that I can be a spiritual man to walk and to surrender to you and help fulfill what you would have me to do. So the prep work is to be a spiritual man or woman. The prep work is what you do before those times hit. Sitting with the Lord, worshiping, praying, reading God's word, fellowshipping among believers, finding opportunities to serve so that you are strengthened when those times come. And also the implication is a cup twofold. One, that with meekness you will arrive at the situation and take care of it. You won't, you won't be full of pride where you can't deal with it. But more importantly in the text, the understanding is so that when you come to the situation that you're very careful about it and have discernment so that you don't trip up over the thing that that brother or sister tripped up on that you don't fall into the same category of sin. I'll give you a, a very real example. There was a situation with a couple, and the woman had committed adultery. The woman wanted to be restored. And I knew that there are too many men that have fallen in those situations. And their heart had become bitter, hard in their own life, and then compassionate toward this other, and then finding themselves falling a well into the same sin as well. And those are things you got to have the Spirit to say, don't meet alone. Don't have these times. Make sure others are present. I had a situation where someone wanted, a woman wanted to meet me in, you know, in Rochester, had a real lot of problems. Oh, if you could just stop by. And I'm thinking, uh-uh. Not that I'm saying she had anything going on that she thought, or me. I just knew, I know the enemy. I called up a church up there. I said, do you have a room somewhere that's open that you guys will be there that I can meet because this woman needs counsel, but I want others right around the whole situation, you know, because Kathy, usually I take Kathy. You know, that's kind of my always go-to. 
But in this situation, it, it didn't give itself to that. And they're like, I understand, Kirk, we'll make sure. And I met in an open area with other brothers and sisters all right there walking by and making sure to be able to minister. So you need to be spiritually in tune and strengthened when you deal with these situations. And so it moves on. And it says, bear you one another's burdens and do fulfill the law of Christ. I mean, that's pretty powerful. What is the law of Christ? Well, it's basically what we read. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. You know, because when I'm fallen, I really would like someone to lift me up. And do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And I want to be a brother that comes and lifts someone else up when they fall. And so it's to fulfill the law of Christ. Let every man prove his own work. And then he shall have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. Now this, what, what I, as I dug it out, what it means is that let you, every man, do his own work. You know, basically... I got to continue to grow in my faith, be more holy like the Lord, walk in ways that are right and righteous before God, that I'm growing in my relationship with the Lord, in my Christian behavior, so that I don't have to depend on others in this way, where I feel good about myself because those that I point out are worse than me where I'm one that would point out the faults of others only to make myself feel a little better. <laughs> well, at least I don't do those things. And he says, don't, that's not the way you do things. You, you don't want to do it that way. What you want to do is you want to have your own life be good enough that is not dependent on the mistakes and the falls of others. Example. Jesus talked about two men that were praying. And one religious, high and mighty, said, I thank God I'm not like that sinner. And then the, the measure that he put upon his life is I'm better than him. Instead of I'm more like the Lord. Now that sinner was just honest and said, Lord, I'm a sinner. I don't deserve anything. Forgive me. And the Lord forgave him. He said, which one walked away justified in his prayers? The guy that admitted he was, he was needing the Lord. So here we're encouraged. Let us grow. Let us be spiritual. Let us do acts of these kindness. Let us trust God in it and not be dependent on others either to boast us up or boost us up by saying, oh, don't worry what others are saying. You're doing good. I'd rather be like, why are they saying that, Lord? Maybe there's some truth there and maybe there's some areas that I need to grow in. Or don't be of the type that says, oh, look at that person. Look how, I can't believe they say they're a Christian and look what they're doing. And the only reason I'm doing it is to make myself look good. I would never do that. And he's like, that's all wrong. Don't do it that way. Let every man prove his own work, and then he shall have rejoicing in himself. It's because I'm grown in the Lord, and God's doing a work in me. For every man, it says, shall bear his own burden. Now, it almost seems like it conflicts with verse 2. You know, bear one another's burdens. And then in verse 5, every man should bear his own burden. But when you look into the word burden and you realize what it means in the original language, it's two different words. We translate it the same in English, but in the Greek there were two different words. The one he's saying that you bear one another's burden is something that is so heavy that comes upon you. It, 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 it has this own thing that it, it's from the Greek that means heaviness troublesome moral failure. That when someone's under a burden that is too heavy for them to lift, 
or under a, a, a great moral failure in their life, he says, you go and try to restore that one. You go and lift that one up. If a piano falls on someone, they're going to need some help. If a piano fell on me, I'm not like, oh, it's okay, you know, just throw the thing off. I'll think I can, only not able to, and I'll be like, help, help. You know, give me some people to come and help me. So that's what that means. The other burden, that other word, that is in verse 5, means man's everyday struggles. That they need to bear some of those. And that can be healthy. Now, if they're collapsed, they can't bear their own burden. They need help. But sometimes struggles are good to walk through because it strengthens. I know God has used struggles in my life to strengthen me. It would be wrong if you see a baby bird hatching and you're like, oh, look at them peck at the shell. I'm going to help them and unpeel the shell to make it easier for them to climb out. You'll probably kill that baby bird they needed the struggle to strengthen them for life. But if that bird has no strength to start, then maybe I can start the process and let them finish it. I'll give you another example that, that I've done several times. Is that I'll be at the gym and people ask me, hey, Kirk, can you spot me? And I'm like, okay. So they'll be doing bench pressing. And to spot means I come behind, make sure the bar doesn't collapse on their head or on their neck. You know, if it's too much for them. So I come behind them and I hold the bar. But they're doing the work. I'm just there in case. And it goes down, they bring it up, and they go down, bring it up. And there are moments that I do step in on some of their last reps, you know, and they're like, Ugh! and I'm like, and I help them a little. Because to get that last bit out of them, and then I'll say, let's do one more. And they're like, oh, you know, but I'm here to help you. But how strong would they get if they laid down on the bench, put their hands on the bar, and I'm doing this all the time? Boy, I lifted 315 pounds the other day, and I did three sets of 10. And I'm like, no, you didn't. I did. You know, I'm exhausted. I wouldn't help them at all. That's the difference in the verses. Is when some is under a burden that they absolutely can't get under, you step in. I don't care how messy, I don't care if it's their fault, it doesn't matter, restore that person. But you don't want to just coddle the person and never let them have a, cha a challenge, or you end up what we see in our society, snowflakes, you know, as they call them. We see people that can't handle anything, and that's not good for their life either. So that's, there's that moderation, man, you can't get up, I'm going to help you up. You're, you're in a struggle, I'll still help you, but I'll be that support person, you know. I'll come and be the support and have you do some of the footwork and navigate so you learn and able to function and, and really succeed in life. So that's the difference between verses 2 and 5. But in all of it, we're called Lord to ask the Lord, Lord, give us more compassion. Move me out of myself. May I be a spiritual man that is not so invested in my problems that I can invest in someone else's and help them along. And I can tell you this, the best therapy for your life sometimes, this sometimes is true, the best therapy for your life and your problems is to help someone else. And it moves you out of that place of despair and dis depression and moves you into a purpose and a focus. And in all of that, we say, Lord, multiply what's left in me. And he multiplies and he strengthens you for his work.
It's a, it's a real needed thing in the days we're living in. And God will strengthen you to do it. I'm going to stop there and we'll pick it up next week. So why don't we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us some time in your word. We thank you for the opportunities that you lay in our path to help others. And I thank you, Lord, for the opportunities you give others to help me. May we function in that proper way. Lord, I'm reminded of how that, that word that encourages us to bear one another's burdens, that understanding is to repair or to rend, kind of like to fix the hole in a broken net for the fishermen because it's going to help the catch and fish are not going to slip through it. You've encouraged us that this, if we give of ourselves, will actually benefit and bless and increase your kingdom. So may you move our hearts with compassion and we thank you for your strengthening. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.